of his health radio i'm ian jessup cory elland is away today when he got cancer again this year it was for the fourth time the doctor said he was going to die and there was nothing more they could do but he took his health into his own hands is using cannabis oil and is out to prove the doctors wrong and joining us all the way from australia is tony fitzgerald tony good of you to do this thanks very much it's a pleasure, Ian, an absolute pleasure. Now, let's go back to 2012, when you got cancer for the first time. Tell us that story. Life for me back then in 2012 was going exceptionally well um, in all facets of my life. And and then um, I had this persistent cough, and it was in the winter time. So, you know, you're thinking, right, maybe it's a cold, it's, you know, some sort of virus or tonsillitis but it was persistent and persistent to the point where it was becoming so painful when I coughed that you know I was getting a little bit concerned but then what happened was on my left side of my neck there was a great big golf ball um, in the left side of my neck and I didn't know what that was I just thought well maybe one of my lymph nodes is, is reacting to the cold or the virus, but it was quite large. So I went down to the doctor and straight away, within about five minutes, he just said, look, you know, I hate to, to really sort of be the bearer of bad news, but this might be possible cancer. Um, and I went, whoa, um, possible cancer? He said, yeah, and so we actually send you off to a head and neck specialist to have further um further studies and maybe a biopsy so I said yeah alright okay so um, I left and I just went whoa well hang on a minute let's not get carried away let's let's get this confirmed um, and then I went to a head and neck specialist um, and had the biopsy but the biopsy then came back and it was not sort of conclusive there was a bit of a grey area so that was two weeks when I was told that was possible cancer then I had to wait another two weeks to get another biopsy so that was like a month sort of thinking well do I have cancer or not and when you go through that situation your mind goes in all these different areas so um, a month later I was confirmed that yes I did have cancer um, and it was in the left tonsil um, that was the primary with the secondary cancer in the nodes in the left side of my neck um, so then that's when you know, decisions had to be made about what sort of treatment um, I was going to undertake. What sort of treatments did you undergo, Tony? Well, I'm a curious type of guy, so I got on the net and I was searching around and, you know, I heard people that cured their cancer just by, you know, changing their diet and and uh, dealing with emotions and whatever. And I rang up one of my good friends who basically beat cancer, breast cancer by just dietary uh, means. And I called her up, she came to Coogee, we sat down, we had a discussion. So I was thinking, well, maybe I'll go down the dietary track. Um, but then I started talking to the doctors and they were recommending radiotherapy with chemotherapy, seven weeks of radiotherapy. and. I think it was four weeks of chemotherapy. So I was sort of, you know, on the fence making a decision. And I suppose when I reflect back, even though I believe now it was the wrong decision, I made the decision to go down the traditional path of doing radio and chemo. And I think what drove that was um, fear. I can't imagine what goes through your mind when the doctor tells you that you have cancer. I mean, your mind just must be spinning. <laughs> yeah, it goes in all different places, but my background being a uh, motivational speaker and a life coach and an author, I've got a pretty sharp mind, and, and although it sort of caught me in a moment where I went, well, my life could be uh, turned upside down like so many other people, I just had to sort of find the words in my mind that really created the shift. And I think this is a really empowering thing for anybody that might be listening to this call. When you get cancer, you have to be bigger than the event at hand. You have to say to yourself, well, it doesn't matter what happens to me, it's what I do about it. And that's what I did back then. And I, even though, you know, I had to make some calls to get certain treatment, my mind was saying, well, you've never been in this position before. You have to make a decision 
and back then um, my first what I call roll of the dice was to put my faith in and hope in uh, radio and chemo even though I had doubts about it and I knew the toxicity of it all yeah, I started the radiotherapy and then the chemotherapy, I had a really, really bad reaction to that and I had to stop halfway through. So, um, and yeah, that was quite, a, quite an experience. So, Tony, after radiotherapy and chemotherapy, even though you stopped chemo halfway through, were you mm. clear of cancer? Well, they said 80%, um, you know, okay zone, um, and they were quite happy with the results. And I thought, yep, okay, it looks like I'm clear of cancer. And, and they basically said, look, you've got a pretty good life and um, we expect you're going to live, you know, a lot, lot longer. But, uh, you know, 2015, it came back again. So, um, yeah, another challenge. No, when it came back in 2015, as a matter of fact, it came back twice that year. You were diagnosed with cancer twice. The first time, was it in the same spot, the same type of cancer? No, it was, um, it was a different one. This time, you know, in December 2014, I had blood coming out my left side of my nose, and I couldn't hear out of my left side of my ear. So I took myself off to a head and neck specialist here in Orange, and um, even though he knew my record and history, he diagnosed my blood coming from my left nose and my blocked station tube as bullious meningitis, only to find out later on he was completely wrong. What was happening in there was a, a tumour about the size of a golf ball in the nasal pharynx area. So that was pushing up against the station tube, which was blocking that, and that's why I couldn't hear and it was also creating the blood to come out the left side of my nose. And what they basically came up with uh, was just a hypothetical sort of assumption that that wasn't a reoccurrence, it was a new cancer, but what they suspected, there was a microscopic tail connected to a muscle that goes from the tonsil up to the back of the nasal pharynx area. And they think that it wasn't picked up in any of the PET scans or MRIs, but also through radiation it wasn't covered. And that microscopic tail after a, a while came back. And that was in February 2015 when that nasal pharynx tumour came up. Yeah, it was pushed up against the C1 and wrapped around the carotid artery down the left-hand side. So it was quite, yeah, quite severe. How did they deal with it? Uh, well, once again, the path they wanted to take me down was radiotherapy and chemotherapy. And once again, I found myself in a position going, right, what do I do? What do I do? And um, I decided not to have any chemotherapy. Um, once again, everybody was saying to me, get onto medical cannabis, get onto medical cannabis. And, and, I, and I will say this back then, I thought that the medical cannabis was for the pain relief more so than a healing component of the plant. Although I might not have heard the medicinal healing component of that somehow, I must have filtered that out. All I heard was take the THC, it'll stop the pain from the radiation that I've been getting from the burnt neck. So I had to make another decision, so I just took the path of radiotherapy. So once again, another seven weeks of radiotherapy in that nasal pharynx area. So your cancer, when it came back the second time, was in a different spot, but it was related to your first cancer. Do I have that well, right? Yeah, that's the theory, yeah. That's the theory. Okay, so yeah. you deal with, with radiotherapy and chemotherapy, yep. and... Did they feel as though it was cleared after that? Well, they believed that it was cleared and everything would have been okay from 2012. But then, you know, 2015 it came back and they were, you know, quite surprised that it came back again. And, and like they said, they, they just think that it might have been a microscopic tail that they could not see. It wasn't present and that it came up and um, presented itself as a nasal pharynx. And by the way, the cancer that I've got is HPV-16 related as well, which is, it's an epidemic out there. 
um, the two deadliest strains. I think it's about 100 different strains of HPV, but HPV 16 and 18 is the deadliest, um, and HPV 16 is the one that I had. It's human papillomavirus. Yes, human papillomavirus um, contracted through oral sex. I think the first major sort of announcement of a person that got that was Michael Douglas. He came out and said he had throat cancer, but he came out a few weeks later on and said, well, hang on, guys, let me correct this. Um, the, the cancer that I've got is HPV-16 related to oral sex, and that's how you transmit the, um, the HPV-16 virus. Now, Tony, all the time uh, while you're going through this, in the back of your mind, people are telling you to take medicinal cannabis, but you went the traditional route again. Now, in 2015, you got diagnosed with cancer a third time. Correct. Now, what was this about? (laughs) Well, I had to wait seven weeks after the second bout of cancer and um, to see if they've got the nasal pharynx tumor and... They were very, very happy. And back then, they actually gave me three months to live. Um, they said you had got, th- three months to live? Yeah, three months to live back then, yeah. Because I said to the doctor, like, this nasal pharynx tumor seems to be pretty aggressive. It's like, you know, in the nasal pharynx area, wrapped around the carotid artery, pushing up against the, uh, the C1. This looks pretty bad, doctor. And he goes, yep. I said, just give it to me. Give me the news. And he said, you've only got three months to live. So I've gone, whoa, and he said, go home, get your affairs in order that weekend uh, because you haven't got long to go. He was an encouraging so, chap, wasn't he? <laughs> uh, uh, well, most doctors and uh, oncologists are. I don't know what they're like over there in America, but they always deliver bad news down here. Yeah, it's the same here. It's no different. <laughs> yeah, seven weeks after the second bout, the PET scan confirmed that the cancer came back to the lymph nodes in the left and the right hand side of the neck. I said the oncologist, like, what does this mean? He said, well, we can't do any more radio, chemo, and by the way, I've got one kidney as well, so the um, chemotherapy wasn't going to work and I just wasn't going to take it anyway from the first experience. So I said, well, what do we have? And they said, we're going to do a radical neck um, dissection from your left and right ear. We're going to lift up your whole neck and take out the lymph nodes, the cancerous lymph nodes in the left and right hand side of the neck. Um, so that was a major surgery. I think it was about 14 hours on the surgery table. So they did that and uh, basically successfully got all the cancer out and gave good margins and uh, left my neck very severely uh, damaged from left to, to right. I've got bad trismus. The best way to describe it is like a... a um, Bow constrictor snake wrapped around my neck, squeezing it 24-7 every day. That's it's a woody neck. It's so tight. So that's the post-surgery is, effects. Is it, is it painful? Yes, it can be, yeah, at times. Yeah. And sometimes uh, you get the asphyxiation type of feeling and effect sometimes. Tony, I'm listening to your story and I'm thinking, boy, you need some good luck. <laughs> you've had uh, you've had some very serious problems. So you dealt with that in 2015, and this year you received some more bad news. What was it? Well, it seems to come every uh, every January, February. Um, January, I wasn't feeling all that great. Um, I was feeling pain in the the left and right tongue area. So I took myself back to the oncologist and he said, we'd better do a PET scan. So we did a PET scan. That was in January, late January this year. Um, And the news was that um, the cancer was back in the left and right tongue area, uh, the left lymph nodes, uh, just at the top of the trachea and the chest area, and a small lymph node under the right side of my um, armpit. So, yeah, yeah. and this time, the news was not so good. This time, they just said, look, we're 99.9% sure that the cancer's back again. There's several inflammations, severe inflammations in your body that we detect. I said, what does that mean? And they said, not good. I said, what does that mean? They said, you're going to die. And I said, what does that mean? How long do I have? And they said, within the next 18 months. 
So there's nothing we can do except immunology, which is a new drug they're trialing. It's not um, fundable through Medicare. You have to pay that yourself. Um, it's still in the beta trial stages, so we really haven't got any good statistical trial um, results. But however, that's an option for you. And I said, no, I'm not going to do the immunotherapy. I have to go away and um, think about what the next step is. Yeah, that day was quite impactful because when they say there's nothing more they, they can do, you go, well, now it's time to dig in. Now it's time to find a alternative cure. And this is where I... I don't say stumbled, but I think purposely converted to cannabis, and, and this is where the story of cannabis starts to take over from here on in. Tony, what was your attitude toward cannabis prior to your diagnosis earlier this year? You mentioned earlier um, that, that you thought it was primarily just for pain, pain relief. Yeah, well, I knew recreational, um, and, you know, I took it as a young kid for recreational purposes when I was young. So I had that association to it. I had an association that, yes, it could kill the pain, although I sort of knew that, you know, I think back then I, I saw the Rick Simpson video and, and I don't know, for some reason or other, it just didn't register. You know, you can be told a message and told a message and told a message and you don't get it. And then all of a sudden, you hear it for the fourth time and you go, you know, I get it now. And, and that's what happened to me. Now, how were you dealing with all of this psychologically during this period? Oh, look, psychologically, when I was told the news in the hospital, you know, I started crying. I broke down and started crying and... And I just thought that was it, you know, that was the end of the line and my lights were going to switch, be switched off. And, and Sophie, who's the speech pathologist there at the hospital, she started crying and another nurse started crying because I've got a very good relationship with the staff there in the oncology unit because I've been back so many times. They get to know me, I'm like a brother to them. Um, but, yeah, I took it pretty hard. But then once again, within... 24 hours, I just had to turn that mindset back on and go, right, it doesn't matter what happens to you, it's what you do that matters. It doesn't matter what happens to you, it's what you do that matters. And straight away I went, right, I've got to galvanise myself. I've got to, I've got to be bigger than the event at hand. I've got to find a cure for this. And this is where this miraculous, serendipitous, synchronistic moment happened. Um, uh, via Facebook too, by the way. <laughs> tell, tell us the power of Facebook. You tell us the story. Well, what happened was, uh, you know, I broadcast that I did have cancer and things weren't looking great, and you know, I've, I had 380 responses on my Facebook page and 150 private messages and people ringing me. But one person on Facebook said, "You want to speak to Andre and Darling, a French couple, beautiful French couple, up in." the Gold Coast because they cure their cancer through a radical um, food dietary plan. So we connected through Facebook and they started sharing their protocol with me, which I adopted straight away because that was one of the first things I did because I think food, the intake of vitamins and minerals and getting that component right and detoxing your body and getting a pH level is crucial. But they also said to me, oh, have you heard of the new series that's out called The Sacred Plan? And I said, no. And they said, well, they're rolling out these episodes where you can watch them free for a certain period of time and then they switch them off. But the whole series is available for sale. And I went, wow. So that weekend I started watching the videos and you wouldn't believe it, but then I was immersed in this whole thing about cannabis. I watched 100 hours in one weekend and I immersed myself in understanding the plant, the power in the plant, just by watching YouTube videos and taking notes in a Word document. Yeah, it was a great series, wasn't it? It was very valuable. Oh, fantastic. So um, how did you get your hands on cannabis? Because Australia is very much uh, against 
both is it both medicinal and recreational cannabis correct yeah well, we've only just introduced it um uh, into australia at the moment and, and uh We've still got a long way to go to work out this process. It's the best way to describe it. It's like a horse has jumped out of the starting gate, but there's no jockey on it and no trainer. Um, so the government have approved it, but still doctors are not accepting it down here. But what's happening is we're taking the steps slowly, slowly, and, and we'll get there eventually like every other country. So when I discovered cannabis, believe it or not, everything was quite timely, and I took myself off to the first major cannabis symposium held in Melbourne and it was a three day event where people from Israel, America, Spain um, Europe flew into Australia and, and it was a three day conference and when I took myself off to the conference I was in desperate need to, to find out more about the plant and how to get access to the plant and um, when I was at the conference the second last speaker on the day was a guy called Michael Stutman, who basically had this massive great big hole in the side of his neck, a big tumour, very similar to the tumour that I had in my left hand side of my neck. He didn't do any radio or chemo. He had surgery to take out his um, spot on the top of his head that started the cancer. But no radio and chemo, and he cured himself by using cannabis within one month. And I sat there in the back of the audience and I went, wow, this is validation, this is proof, this is anecdotal evidence that, you know, somebody like me took a different path. And I had radio chemo, radio, radical neck surgery, um, a terrible, terrible bad journey. But then this other guy just decided, you know, he was in a bad position before he took the cannabis, but as soon as he took the cannabis... He was healed within one month, and I went, that's proof enough for me that it works. And it was that moment in time when I totally believed that cannabis could be the cure for my cancer. There's a synchronicity here, isn't there, Tony? Yeah. yeah. About uh, watching the videos, going to the conference, introducing you to cannabis oil. It's like a bit of a journey, step by step by step, and finally you got it. Yeah, right. Some of us need to be slapped on the side of the head to get it. But, uh, <laughs> some of us yeah, take, the, it takes a little longer. And the crazy thing is, is that was the second last speaker. So when the conference was finished and I came out of the conference, I was so happy that I got the information that I needed because I got empowered because knowledge empowers people. So I was empowered. But I also immersed myself with that 100 hours the weekend previously. So I went there quite educated and quite knowledgeable. But then I got another step up and got more knowledgeable. And I collected 70 business cards while I was there. I networked feverishly with every person that was there, which was an expert from around the world. And then the last person that I meet on my way out of the conference was a guy that was a producer of cannabis oil who was telling another guy how he cures certain illnesses and how he helps people and how he's helped people with head and neck cancer. And I ever heard that and I went over and I bumped into the conversation and went, excuse me, but I don't mean to be rude, but did you say that you make cannabis oil? And he goes, yes, been doing it for 30 years. Now, mind you, this is an illegal market here in Australia and um, I said, well, you know, where do I get it? How can I get hold of it? And as I was talking to him, my tongue actually froze because when I got my left side of my neck cut, it cut the nerve. So sometimes my, my tongue freezes. So as I was talking to him, it froze and I couldn't talk to him. So he pulls out a bottle of oil on the spot, looks around like, you know, to make sure nobody's watching and says, here, put this in your mouth. And they're like, now because this will work for you and, st and stop the seizure and stop the pain. And I squirted it in, and within 15 minutes, the seizure stopped and the pain went, and he said to me, how's that? And I went, wow. And straight away, I got instant relief on the spot. That is a remarkable story. Now, you started taking cannabis oil on a regular basis, I assume, after that. Correct. And how, how did it work for you? 
Well, when I left Melbourne, I had to jump on a plane and get back to Sydney. So I was freaking out that I had, you know, cannabis in my bag. I'm crossing state lines. Is it going to be an issue? Am I going to be pulled up? So that was another hurdle that I had to overcome. And I got through that. And I thought, wow, you know, I just did my first drug run <laughs> and just had a bit of a laugh about it. And then I accessed the cannabis and the first night that I took it, um, believe it or not, because I've been radiotherapy twice in the neck, my saliva glands are non-existent. And straight away that night, my saliva glands started to work. So I had this great big gunky mess rolling out of my mouth. I got up and switched the light on and went, my God, my saliva glands are working. And they work now. So I'm taking CBD um, and I'm taking THC. And over the last two and a half months, uh, my inflammation in my neck has gone down by 30%. My energy level and how I feel every day is really boosted. It's like... Four months ago, I had really weak and lethargic sort of moments and not motivated and I was really lacking energy and and I was only on fluids and I dropped from 78 kilos down to 60 kilos. But um, I started eating again and I because the inflammation went down inside my neck, I started to eat fish and some solid food. So now I'm starting to put on weight again, so I put on another eight kilos in the last couple of weeks. So they're the things that are... And people around me, not only do I know that that things have changed within me, I go by what people see around me and they see me and they go, wow, look at your eyes. They're really green and very clear and your skin complexion's fantastic and you've got a bounce in your step and you can talk a lot better and you've just got this new liveliness about you whereas four months ago most people were thinking that you know i was down and out i was gone so the lights were going to be switched off you know tony looking at you as we do this over skype i see you and you look healthy you don't look like there's anything wrong with you I mean, no i feel healthy what is the state of your cancer today well i went to the oncologist last week and he was quite amazed. He um, he looked at me and said, he put the scope up my ne- nose and went down the back and he had a look and he said, yeah, he said, the information's gone down. He said, there seems to be a little bit of activity in the epiglottis area. And I said, yeah. And he said, are you getting food down? And I said, yeah, no fluids. I said, because last time I was in, that was just so blocked off. Um, And he said, well, yeah, he said, there's been some marginal improvement. And I said, well, I think about 30%. Would I be correct? And he goes, probably, yeah. And he knows that I'm on the cannabis, and I told him about it. And then I said, the saliva gland. So I actually produced the saliva on the spot and let it roll out. And he looked (laughs) like that, and he just went, he said, so you got your saliva glands back again? I said, yep, by taking cannabis. And he just went, well, that's great news. And then um, he felt around my neck area and, and he said that, you know, this area here it seems to be down the nodes here have gone and receded. Um, and there's only one node which went from underneath the armpit that went from a one and a half inches to two and a half inches. So it's gone up in size, but there's no pain. It hasn't actually gone any bigger. But he said... That could be just a cleansing of the lymphatic system when we wouldn't be too worried about it. But he said, overall, your appearance um, and what I've discovered down the back of your neck um, and by what I've felt, he said, just keep doing what you're doing because whatever you're doing seems to be working. Now, so, when, yeah, when you left the doctor's office, did you jump and kick your heels and, <laughs> and celebrate? <laughs> yeah, well, everything's a celebration, you know. I, You know... In a way, I'm grateful that I've got cancer, and I say that to people, you know, because it's radically transformed and pivoted my life in a whole area where, you know, I love what I'm doing, and I love the practice of really extreme self-care, and every time I get great news, I celebrate it. If I get some bad news, I still celebrate it now, because I go, well, okay, I got bad news, but what can I do and learn to uh, make that good news? 
Sounds like it was a bit of a wake-up call for you. Oh, definitely. You know, um, to be in this position now, and I'll say it, I'm, a, I'm now officially a cannabis educator, even though my past is all about motivation and education and teaching. Now I'm just getting so much joy and bliss out of you know, just helping people navigate the pathway to getting access to cannabis, just like I've done. It was like a deep, dark forest, and I was looking for somebody with a torch to guide me out of the deep, dark forest. But I led myself out of the deep, dark forest with the help of some other people around me. And now I, I know how to navigate through that deep, dark forest, and I like to share that with other people. So it was like a body hack to a place. I was saying to somebody, out of 55 years of living, I've never felt so connected to a purpose and to a mission of anything that I've done, and I'm quite an innovative and quite entrepreneurial, then what I'm doing now, it's like something's led me to this position right now to basically help other people, not only help myself, but heal myself and cure the cancer that I've got, but also to share because living is about giving. And if I can give back to people some of the things that I've discovered and learned along the way, well, that's what we're put on this planet to do, is to help give other people some insight and some opportunities that they might be able to help cure themselves or fix their illness that they have. So, Tony, is it safe to say that it's given you a different perspective of life, a more appreciative perspective of life? Yeah, you know, as you go through life, you go, well, what's life all about, you know, and and what's the meaning of life? You know, I think at certain times you get connected to your purpose and your mission and, you know, that might be sustainable and might last, um, but then it might sort of evaporate and disappear and then you're sort of searching around for the next meaning or the next purpose. And it's like, for me, it's like a, a reawakening. It's like a rebirth. It's like a a total body hack that's taken place like being down at Melbourne and being at that event and then meeting all these people and having the opportunity to connect and be on your radio show and being asked to go to places and talk seems to be something that's happened from a greater power to say Tony, this is what you're going to do for the rest of your life, and this is what I will do for the rest of my life. Tony, these anecdotal stories that we broadcast on Cannabis Health Radio, like your own and many others, they are very educational for people, I think, and they're very helpful for people because what it does, it empowers individuals. They can take health, their health into their own hands if they choose the right steps. And just like you, you went to Melbourne, you went to the conference, as you were leaving, you overheard this fellow have a conversation, and you had this problem with your tongue, and he just happened to have some oil with him, which, I mean, it changed your life forever, didn't it? I say to people that journey was just, you know, it was just crazy, it was weird, but it was meant to be, and, and it was just funny how things panned out and there's one other thing that I that I've that I've left out which I need to tell which sort of put a cap on the whole lot of this journey that I went on. When I discovered um, Cannabis and the Power it was one of the documentaries in Australia that was filmed about a guy called Dan Haslam and the, uh, the Haslam family were the ones that instigated the change in legislation down here in Australia. It was a fantastic documentary. And in the part of the documentary, the beginning, um, Sophie um, Kapalopis, the um, reporter, took herself off to Israel to go to see Dr. Raphael Mushalem. And um, I went, who is this guy? And he's the grandfather and the, the guy that studied the plant and discovered the cannabinoids and the power of the plant. And when I started watching his videos... I watched about seven of them. Um, One of the reporters there and a couple of other reporters said to him, um, when he started talking about curing cancer and reducing tumours in mice, which are mammals, and human beings are mammals, one reporter just looked at him and sort of rolled his eyes and went, um, his physiology was quite, like, curious and intriguing. And he said, well, 
are you saying that cannabis can cure cancer? And Raphael's always response was, well, maybe so, or I think so. However, without clinical medical human trials being carried out, the medical profession and physicians around the world will not accept this. And I kept on hearing it, I kept on hearing it, and I went, why isn't there, or why hasn't there been like a major medical human clinical trial done using cannabis on humans? So we can validate this once and for all, get it over the line, get the medical profession um, accepting it, embracing it, and introducing it back into humanity. So I sent this email to Raphael at 1.30 in the morning, outlining my cancer and my journey and asking him, can I get the formula for cannabis off you for my, my treatment? But also asking him, what's this thing about your issue of not raising or being able to raise funds to get clinical trials underway? So next morning, six hours later, I got an email back from him saying, well, here's the THC and the CBD um, formula to take and everything should be okay but he said just remember I'm not a physician or a doctor I'm a professor and this is just a, a guidance formula for you to take and I was pretty stoked about that but he also said yeah I'm a bit sort of um, stunned that nobody's given me any money to carry out these clinical trials so I put my hand up and I said allow me to raise the capital and after a week he came back and said, well, how would you see this rolling out? I said, well, we've just got to raise the money. And if the big farmers are not going to give you the money, which obviously they're not, and the governments won't give you the money, it comes back to what you said earlier on there, Ian, about the power lies within the people. So the people have to immerse themselves and get educated about the plan, the cannabis plan. If we want to change the medical profession around the world that comes in favour of us, not Big Pharma or the medical profession, then we've got to conduct the world's largest crowdfunding campaign to raise the funds that will, the, the funds that will go through to Raphael to start and initiate these clinical trials on a very large scale, which then hopefully within the next two to five years, we'll have that medical evidence-based scientific information available from the trials and then it's all about them accepting it and this might be the hard thing, accepting it and embracing it and let this be in the hands of every human being in the world. I think it's achievable. That's what happened along that whole journey and that's where things now are starting to to unravel for me and some of the things that I'm doing are in alignment with that. Tony, give us a website where people can contact you if they so desire. Well, one is the Facebook page, which is the Green Miracle Man Facebook page. We will have um, the Green Miracle Man project uh, .com up soon um, but you, they can go to www.thecannabisstudy.com and leave their email there if they want to know more about the funding that will take place, the crowdfunding that will take place in the future um, but yeah, so the Green Miracle Man project um, Green Miracle Man Facebook page and then the CannabisStudy.com page as well, and they can put their email address and name in there as well. Tony, it was a great story, fantastic. And we'll check back in with you in about six months and to see how you're doing, because it sounds like you're well on the road to recovery and your health is improving, and that's excellent news. Thanks very much for doing this. Yeah, it was a pleasure, and thanks, Guy. I just want to say that your radio station, when I discovered it and I started listening to it, absolutely awesome and um, most of my education and knowledge has been boosted by listening to your episodes which I listen to every single day as I'm driving so it's invaluable and some of the stories and the way you guys conduct the interviews you're doing absolutely magical things love your work thanks very much appreciate it thanks Tony thank you just a couple of things before we wrap it up if you'd like to help promote Cannabis Health Radio, then send these interviews to your friends on Facebook, email, whatever. And uh, let's spread the word on the medical use of cannabis. And also, you can help us out uh, financially 
by going to our webpage, CannabisHealthRadio.com, and make a donation so we can continue doing this work. Thanks for listening, everyone. You've been listening to the Cannabis Health Radio podcast. Visit our website, CannabisHealthRadio.com, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.